Good evening to the viewing public. I am occupational nurse Lacan from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to our webinar series entitled Hype or Hope, investigating the COVID-19 vaccines. Our topic for discussion today is, will the COVID-19 vaccine help long haulers and asymptomatic persons? Presented by none other than Dr. Nico Ram Ramlachan. Dr. Ramlachan holds a PhD in genetics from Texas A and M University, USA, and a BSc and MSc from the University of Guelph in Canada. She has extensive experience in research in the areas of genetics, specifically in the areas of immunogenetics, clinical genetics, and genomics bacterial and viral biotechnology, forensic DNA analyses, and molecular biology. Dr. Ramlachan has worked with the ministerial appointed DNA committee for implementation of the administration of the DNA Act of 2012 in Trinidad and Tobago. She is involved in genetic testing locally, including SARS-CoV-2 testing and research and is certified in ISO IEC 12025 testing laboratory standards. She has spent the last 25 years doing teaching and research in seven countries in academia and private companies, as well as for the US and Canada, federal governments and international agencies based in Central and South America. Ramlachan was also in, involved in the sequencing of the bovine and the Keiko genomes and is well published internationally. Without further ado, I will now hand you over to Dr. Nicole Ramlachan. Hello, good day everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am very happy to be here to discuss um, part four, I believe it is now, of our series um, on the um, uh, Hypo Hope investigating the COVID-19 vaccination. And in particular today, we're going to discuss the actual um, long haulers and asymptomatic individuals and whether or not they would um, respond to the COVID-19 vaccines in terms of um, the importance of vaccination protocols for those individuals. So just to kind of get into it, um, remember our chain of infection a story I always talk about. Um, we start with the infectious microbe and then there always has to be some sort of reservoir where the virus lives and replicates. So in this case of COVID, um, it was caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which replicates in many different animals from uh, ranging from bats to camels to pangolins and eventually got itself um, a, a host in humans. Now, this is related to the original SARS that um, was responsible for a pandemic back in the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, but it's totally different in that it's mutated on its own away from a bad virus. So that would be the reservoir where they actually live and replicate and mutate to actually form new attachments to new hosts. Then, of course, the portal of exit, how the virus leaves the reservoir, whether it's a mouth, nose, coughing, sneezing, talking, then a mode of transmission, which we know are fomites, which can be either for person to person, airborne, direct contact with contaminated surface, less so, but the other two most definitely. And then of course, again, it has to go through a portal of entry to get into that other individual that's being infected, the mucous membranes of the nose and mouth. And of course, it has to be a susceptible host that has no, no immunity in order for it to be infectious and continue its cycle, right? So that's an important um, understanding of how that virus works. These are some of the symptoms that occurs with COVID-19 that can range from fever, cough, loss of taste or smell, all the way down to breathing difficulties and um, eventually inflammatory syndromes that can actually shut down your organs and so on. Um, and individuals can um, experience any amount or one or single of these symptoms. Originally, the first variant of the um, virus was found in Wuhan, China 
And there were a lot of early stage um, fatality rates with underlying health conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, cancer. And we included these people in the vaccine trials early on because we knew that they were being affected by this virus in larger numbers than um, people with no underlying conditions, which are down here at 0.9%, right? So that was the original variant. And of course, now we know the different variants that are, um, are popping up as well, and that will continue to pop up. Um, are also affecting individuals. Now, the cornerstones of care are ranges from fluids, rest, and acetaminophen all the way up to dialysis, hemodialysis, in the um, case of kidney failure of patients um, that may end in either discharge or death. Um, and it really depends on what happens at this point um, in terms of whether or not people would have long haul syndrome um, uh, kind of conditions where they have different symptoms that actually go on and on and on. In this case, sometimes people, we're 10 months or 12 months into this, and sometimes people still have their symptoms. The individuals who were infected back in December um, are on 15, 16 months, and they still have symptoms, some of them. So the um, drugs and the therapies can get to a certain point, but then the long haulers actually are affected as well too, in addition to those normal individuals who are, um, have acute cases. So just kind of recap the story of the viruses. Um, the, that was the story of the viruses and the infection, right? So just to kind of recap the story of the um, adenovirus vaccines and the mRNA vaccines, right? Um, the mRNA vaccines, if you remember, is packaged into a lipid nanoparticle, and it's made up of a little tiny encoding piece of DNA that codes for the spike protein in particular. Now, what's interesting is that spike protein is the same spike protein that keeps changing all the time in the variants. Now, other proteins are changing as well. We don't care too much about those because our vaccination protocol is against the spike protein. But so far, we seem to have done a good job at covering what we call a conserved area of that spike protein. So regardless of whether or not four or five little mutations occur, it can still carry enough of that antigen into the body as a vaccine so that when that antigen is produced in the form of the spike protein and our antibodies are produced against it, it's enough to recognize it, even though one or two um, bases may change, which may cause a one or two amino acid difference in the protein. Um, the antibodies are still functional against most of the variants that we see today um, with most of the vaccines that we have sub better than others. The adenoviral vaccines are the same idea with the mRNA, except it's packaged into adenovirus, right? Adenovirus is a normal virus that usually gives us the common cold, but we've been able to actually utilize it as a tool to be able to infect individuals, so to speak, by via a, a uh, vaccination. But it's, it's, it's not actually infective to us. It actually allows for the entry of the um, mRNA, again, which goes through to the cell, bypasses the DNA completely. So there's no incorporation with our DNA. So if you're in, interested in that side of the vaccine, there's no way that it can happen um, and is actually able to harness our machinery again to produce only antigen encoded for by that mRNA, which then in turn produces the antibodies and gives us the neutralizing antibody. The DNA vaccines that are coming out out of Canada and other places, very similar to the mRNA in that they're packaged in these lipid nanoparticles, which makes them very, very hard to transport around because they melt. So they have to be kept at very, very cold temperatures, which are minus 70 ultra cold temperatures. So it's very hard to um, cold chain that across in you know, countries like India, um, Africa, us in the Caribbean, uh, where it's hot and we don't have a lot of um, ultra high uh, temperature or low, I should say ultra low temperature uh, means by transporting these, these vaccines, right? But basically it's the same thing, the DNA is released into the cell. This one goes through the cell nucleus to harness the cell machinery to make the DNA, which then makes the viral protein, same concept, produce antibody response, which will then eventually end in a neutralizing antibody immune response. Most important thing here to note, all the different vaccines have the same end result. 100%, close to 100%, 99.99 whatever percent um, against hospitalization and death. And that's what we wanna see. Um, whether or not you actually get infection from the, from the virus if you're vaccinated is, is, is varies from vaccine to vaccine. But at the end of the day, you do not show disease that's severe enough to hospitalize you and you definitely don't die if you've been vaccinated. Um, generally from what we've seen with the variants that, that we've, we've been able to test it on. Sometimes there are very breakthrough cases where people get ill, um, but no, no deaths really, um, are, or very hardly um, are you able to see deaths with individuals who have two doses 
or full dosage of your vaccine. So just to kind of go over what's happening in Trinidad and Tobago, we are on an upswing right now. As you can see from this graph, um, this was May 4th of May, 235 new cases. I heard today there's 399 with four more deaths. The seven day average is about 251. And I want you to look at this um, little uh, diagram down here, which has a little tiny notation that says total cases, 21st of April to 4th of May, 2,571. So that's almost double what we saw um, at the height of, of our cases last year, which was going into September where we had our peak. Um, we are now double that um, in terms of cases, right? Um, so it's on the upswing for sure. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccination in the SARS-CoV-2 infection and how it works, I wanted to put up this in its entirety because this came out from the WHO. Um, the WHO, right? And um, they're saying very clearly that people should be offered vaccination regardless of whether or not they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, including people with prolonged post-COVID-19 symptoms. So they're specifically addressing the idea of the asymptomatic and the long haulers, which is kind of what I wanted to do today. The data from the clinical trials indicate that the currently authorized COVID-19 vaccines can be safely given with anybody with a, a history of COVID-2 infection, and the viral testing has to assess whether or not it's acute, or you can use the antibody or serological testing to assess for prior infection, right? And they're saying it's not necessarily recommended um, in terms of saying whether or not you should get the vaccine or not totally. It's recommended in terms of um, preventing um, symptoms of, of clotting and those kinds of things. But generally your recommendation is going to be the same, whether or not you have positive or, or, or negative for you to, in terms of your vaccination. Right. Um, if you have a known current SARS-CoV-2 infection, they're saying that you should defer it until you've recovered acute illness. If you have really bad symptoms, you shouldn't be vaccinated while you have the bad symptoms, um, because they're saying that um, those who experience infection after the first dose as well, too, um, before the second dose, that should that should apply. Um, they should wait. So they're saying there's no recommended interval between infection and vaccination, but generally um, reinfection is low in the months after initial infection, right? So people are saying somewhere between two weeks all the way up to six months, I've heard, depending on who you talk to, generally it's usually two to four weeks um, to wait if you've had a COVID-19 infection before you've been vaccinated. Um, one concern is people who have received passive antibody therapy for COVID infections. Um, those people who have gotten monoclonal antibodies or plasma convalescent plasma as part of their treatment, they're saying that you need to usually wait, um, even though reinfection is uncommon within 19 days, you should defer your vaccination for at least 90 days, right, to make sure that there's no cross um, problems with the antibodies and so on. If you're receiving antibody treatment for other diseases, there's no um, recommendation for you to hesitate or to wait, right, they're, they're recommending that you, you go into the vaccination protocol like normal. Um, there, this was April 29th, it's a little bit higher now, it's about 120 billion. Uh, sorry, 1.20, 1.2 billion, um, and um, it's increasing every day, right? So equally, it's about um, relatively to 14 doses for every 100 people, but of course, it really depends on the country, right? So we'll see this in this little um, uh, graph here from our world in data, and you could do this at home. Anybody could go online and look at this and look at how the vaccination rate has um, changed over time from December the 19th, 2020, when these vaccinations first came on um, the market, all the way to now, to uh, May the 5th, 2021. Tran Tobago is quite low, um, with our population of 1.4 million. We've just barely crossed 3%. Um, we're the lowest of these countries that we've put on here. Um, India is just above us, um, roughly at about 8, between 8 to 10%, depending. They've slowed down a lot now because their numbers are going up and their vaccination is dropping. Um, then Mexico, Grenada, Brazil, um, Barbados. I want you to look at Barbados. Barbados has done a fantastic job. So far, they're close to 25% um, who've received at least one dose. And that's increasing because they're expecting more and more vaccines um, depending on, um, uh, you know, depending on COVAX and other people, other places. Um, Chile, Bahrain. Um, Bahrain is most um, comparable to us in terms of population size. They're at about 1.7 million, and they've been able to vaccinate almost 48%, close to 48% of their population. Um, and they're quite up, uh, high up there with the UAE as well too, um, which is just above them. And then of course, the United States and the United Kingdom are almost neck and neck. Um, and then Cayman Islands and Bermuda, which are fantastic examples of how when you have a small population, 
in their cases, right around 65, 62,000 in the case of Bermuda, they were able to easily get, you know, um, basically two tranches of vaccines and they're almost there with their, with their um, first doses. And I think they're halfway there with their second doses. And then of course, Israel, which is really the gold standard right now with um, vaccination and, and COVID cases. Um, control of their COVID cases, right? So we're going to go through these, uh, some of these countries in a little more detail a little bit later on. In terms of the underlying disease, um, the hospitalizations were six times higher, and that's 12 times higher for COVID-19 patients who have underlying conditions. So that's cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease. And these are individuals who tend to have long hauler symptoms um, a little bit worse as well, right? Um, and they are at risk of developing fatal illnesses months later in addition. So imagine after you survive the onslaught of what is COVID, which is fantastically um, horrible onto your body, you then now have a almost 60% increased risk of death from long-term publications of the disease up to six months after initial infection, right? Which is crazy. And some of the fatal instances could be um, caused by heart failure, stroke, and chronic kidney, kidney disease, all of which have had um, major effects on these individuals with these long haul kind of um, symptoms. And of course, the health risks overcoming COVID-19 infection increased the more severely person's case was, right? But hospitalized patients who had um, in, um, intubation and those kinds of things in intensive care, the highest risk of having these long um, term COVID-19 complications and death, right? I, I know um, people who've had to learn how to walk and had to go to long term rehab, rehab rehabilitation facilities after um, spending three, four months in the hospital. So it's an it's a, a incredible thing. Um, to have to go through that right after, you know, um, having been hospitalized for so long with COVID. Um, who are the COVID-19 long haulers? Well, they range from individuals who are basically of all ages, right? Um, obviously, the younger ones, um, it's a little bit rare to see. Um, and the very older ones, it's a little bit rare to see. But generally, the highest numbers are within the um, 30 to 60 range, right? Um, which is what we would expect. Um, the main symptoms of COVID-19 long haulers can range from all kinds of different things, but the main ones are headaches, um, what they call foggy brain or difficulty concentrating, muscle body aches, fatigue, inability to be active, difficulty breathing, and then of course the cough, blurry vision, um, fever, heart, heart palpitations, a lot of heart arrhythmias and so on can occur, a neurological disease as well too, back pain, um, neck pain, um, tinnitus in the ears, clogged ears, the feeling that you have an ear infection, um, then of course, hair loss, um, and then all kinds of different things could happen respiratory wise as well too. And then of course, GI, nausea, vomiting, those kinds of things. So it ranges from a, a whole gamut, but it runs through pretty much all the clinical areas that we study. Um, most frequent post COVID symptoms are usually brain fog, as they call it, where they, they just can't think clearly. Um, headaches, numbness, taste and smell disorders. Um, fatigue is one of the number ones um, complaints and, and muscle and body aches, shortness of breath and difficulty breathing, difficulty concentrating or focusing, inability to exercise, headache, sleeping, anxiety, memory problems, and, and dizziness, right? Um, what about young adults? There are young long holders who are, are young adults, and these are individuals that are usually not thought to be very susceptible to COVID, but they got the COVID-19. Um, SARS-CoV-2 virus infection and ended up with long haul sim um, um, symptoms. So these are usually previously healthy young adults and they went back to usual health up to 21 days after testing positive, right? So um, these are people 18 to 34 and they usually have more than a month or two months um, at least of symptoms, sometimes more than that in excess of six months. So it's happening to everybody in all the age groups, right? Um, vaccines have actually shown to improve symptoms for COVID-19 long haulers. I do a lot of these um, snapshots of actual research articles and newspaper articles to kind of show you all this is, you know, it's in, it's in the internet, the wool of the internet for you to be able to find. So you can find it, you can look it up, you could see it for yourself. Um, this survey was done by the Survivor Corps uh, uh, and said that about 40% of those with lingering symptoms of COVID-19 saw improvement following vaccination, which was fantastic. It was an unexpected um, a bonus because, of course, um, long haul people weren't included in the phase two, three trials last year because we didn't have any, right? Because the vaccine only really started to show up November, December in the wool um, and then everywhere else afterwards. So this was really a really good um, plus. Um, for example, 40% of 577 long COVID, long term, they call them long term or long COVID patients or long haulers. 
um, contacted in the survey said that they felt better immediately after getting vaccinations, right? Which was great. And among the patients um, of this particular individual, Dr. Daniel Griffin, who was at Columbia, New York, he said in particular the brain fog that everybody was having and the GI tract seemed to resolve very quickly post-vaccination. I had friends who said different things had happened to them um, positively, including um, pain in their legs and so on that, that dissipated. Um, and he's actually doing a long term study, as are many other um, scientists around the world, and they're estimating that up to 30 to 40 percent of patients and long haulers actually feel better. Um, because what happens after their second dose, they actually get like a boost of immunity. So sometimes they're able to clear the virus just as it in point. And the vaccine gives their immune system a little boost that says, okay, we'll take out everybody. We know these guys are bad. Um, we know you all had a hard time. You don't have enough antibodies. Let's give you a little boost and give you a little bit raised um, antibody level, which is what they get. And that's usually enough to clear out those long-term bad guys that are still lingering around, um, giving them that, sim that symptom as well too. And it also boosts your general immune system to be able to clear out a lot of the inflammatory effects that um, cause the long-term disease that we're actually seeing. So they're much less likely to have long-lasting symptoms post-vaccination, and uh, most vaccinated are actually reporting that their symptoms are being totally alleviated, at least for a period of time. Of course, now we've started doing more and more studies, we'll know how long they're actually being alleviated for and so on, right? Um, just to answer some other questions too about who can get vaccinated if it is that you've had exposure, all those kinds of things. Um, right now, they're not recommended for outbreaks um, in terms of if you know there's an active outbreak management. You're not going to vaccinate people necessary to, to, to treat prophylactically, treat um, uh, exposure if you've already been exposed, right? So um, if you've already been exposed, you generally have to do your 14-day your quarantine period. And they're saying that um, the, the COVID-19, four to five days of, of a dose of COVID vaccine would not provide adequate immune response within the incubation period. So you might as well wait right, um, for pro post-exposure prophylaxis or vaccination is what, is what they call it. So generally two weeks. If you've known you've been exposed, wait two weeks to be vaccinated, right, generally, except for individuals who are in congregate healthcare settings. So that would be the long-term care facilities, the old age homes, the detention facilities, correctional facilities. Those individuals are going to be constantly exposed as a cycle. So they should be vaccinated at all point at all points in time. They sh you shouldn't wait at any point in time because you never know when their exposure is going to stop and start because of the um, living quarters and, and the exposure rate of which they would um, have that's going to be continuously repeated in the long term, right? So those individuals, um, they are saying that it's it, the risk is not really high for them to be vaccinated, even though they be constantly exposed. It's okay for them to get vaccinated, right? Um, for individuals who sub subsequently develop, develop COVID-19, um, for vaccinated people who have either develop it in between shots or at the end of the second shot, um, whether or not you had a vaccine should not affect the treatment. The treatment is going to be the same. Monoclonal antibodies, convalescence plasma, antiviral treatment, corticosteroid administration, and when you do it, it's going to be the same. Um, if a person is fully vaccinated, well, then that's highly unusual, right, for somebody to actually get a full COVID-19 infection if they're fully vaccinated. Um, if they are two weeks after completion of the two dose or um, either the single dose of the Johnson, 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 and they test positive for the SARS-CoV-2, then you need to request the specimen to report the case and those kinds of things. But these breakthrough cases have only been um, seen in about 56, um, 72 to 78, out of 78 million people, <clears throat> specifically in the UK um, of the last study that I looked at. Um, we constantly looking at those breakthrough cases. They happen for all other kinds of vaccines as well, um, but it seems to be pretty low for COVID-19 so far, which is great. Um, the interchangeability, a lot of people are asking about that. Um, can any COVID-19 can be used? Yes, um, there should be no product preference in terms of I want this vaccine over the other. And also too, as of now, they're not interchangeable. I mentioned on Monday that there's a study going on in the UK um, to try to see whether or not they can follow up AstraZeneca with mRNA or follow up mRNA with AstraZeneca and so on um, in terms of the type of vaccine, um, because they are assuming that you're going to be have a little extra protection because the nature in which the vaccine is um, working in your body is a little bit different. But generally, the safety and efficacy of a mixed series is not evaluated to date and it's not recommended. So if you get the first dose of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine and the patient is unable to complete the series, um, it's recommended that you try to get um, the, the um, 
uh, series as close together uh, from one of the other mRNAs as close together as possible. Um, the single dose from the Janssen can be administered about 20 days from the mRNA dose if it's available and you are considered to have received a valid single dose Janssen vaccination and not a mixed in case you aren't able to get one of the other mRNA vaccines. But of course that doesn't apply to us because we don't have either Johnson Johnson or mRNA vaccines here in our region to date. Um, what about another vaccine? This is an important point that needs to be stated because um, last week was World Immunization Week and a lot of people are, are getting vaccinated for many different things. Um, and you need to understand the co-administration of the COVID-19 vaccines with the other vaccines. Um, currently, it's authorized that um, COVID-19 vaccines are all inactivated, so therefore they should be administered alone with a minimum interval of about 14 days before or after the administration of any other vaccines. But a short individual can be used if it is the benefits of vaccination are deemed to outweigh. So that means tetanus, if you've been exposed and you have to get your tetanus vaccine, go ahead and get it. For wound management, those kinds of things. TB, um, those kinds of things are recommended um, because you're going to, you want to avoid the barriers or delays to vaccination and those, those things aren't going to matter as much. Um, but just generally for optional vaccines or boosters, I should try to um, spread it out, right? At least two weeks apart. Um, the P1 variant is in Trinidad is confirmed. We have at least 20 cases. Um, sequencing is a little slow right now because of the time it takes, um, but we are getting more and more of that, of course, because of our proximity to South America. It would have been assumed that we would eventually get it because the P1, of course, is coming from Brazil and is spread rampant throughout now um, most of South America. Um, the India cases are a little bit different in that they have several variants. Now, what is interesting about India is that they have double mutants and triple mutants and probably other mutants that haven't even been detected. Why? Because they're only sequencing about 1% of their population. So we aren't able to actually see variants. Um, secondly, they have a massive pool. So the virus loves to mutate, right? Because that's what it does. And the more and more people who are unvaccinated, who are exposed to it, the more chances they have to mutate. So about 1.44 billion people, lots of mutations, right? They also have a high rate of very poor people, unable to socially distance, very low access to cell health care, and um, they've been underestimating the mortality. So it's really hard to determine exactly what's happening with these new variants. We don't know what's there. We know that there's at least a double and a triple that we know about. Seems to be evading um, some level of treatment. That's why we're getting mortality so high. If you look at the peak care, I mean, it's, I, you know, I don't know, that's almost 70 times what it was um, merely a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, they have the Oxford AstraZeneca, their own Covaxin. Well, the Astra, Astra, AstraZeneca is being produced locally in India with the Serum Institute of, of India uh, in the form of the, um, the COVID shield vaccine, but it's the same formulation because that was shared. Um, Covaxin, which is their own version, um, which is a attenuated vaccine and Sputnik V, which is coming in, or Sputnik V, I don't even know which one they're calling it, from Russia. And these are all adenoviral uh, vaccines, right? Um, and they work the same way. Um, they work, they, the way that their package is a little bit different, but generally they work the same way. So they have access to vaccines, but very low num in terms of numbers, right? And they've not been able to access their people for vaccination, which is one of the problems. Um, what was happening in Brazil? So there's a lot of babies that are dying in um, COVID-19 in Brazil lately, um, in the last couple of months, and really because of the lack of lockdown. So their political um, beings have stated that there's no need to lockdown. So there's absolutely no lockdown in Brazil. There's free movement as ever. There's no mask ordinance or anything like that. And so the spread of the P1 variant is rampant, especially around the barrios and the susceptible economic, socioeconomical groups. Um, the scientists specifically concerning the children are saying the death rate is still very low, but it kind of reflects the overall rate that's increasing for everybody else, right? Um, only about 5.8% of the, the COVID deaths have been uh, individuals under nine, but that accounts for about 3,000 children, which is pretty high as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, and the vaccines are, will be eventually given to the children in Brazil as well too. Brazil is actually producing their own vaccine as well. That should come online in a couple of months. Um, but their cases, again, it's, it's related a lot to the, the inability to people to isolate and the lack of people being able to, to um, do things like mask wearing and on. Um, the world uh, standard in terms of control of COVID-19 has been Israel. Um, I just wanted to show you all the start at December 20th when they started their vaccination. They were able to ramp up really 
um, really high in terms of they were able to get to 31% in terms of vaccination by January 24th. But look what happened. Their numbers were increasing, right? Exponentially between December the 20th and January 24th within that month. But they were able to pull down those numbers when they got to, to, to the 31st um, percentage percentile of vaccination. And then they continued to go down. Now they had a little bit of peaks and, and flows and peaks and flows, but generally they are way down now and they're at about 61%. So the closer they get to the 80% or 85% that they're aiming for, um, the easier that it is. Um, one thing I would like you to note is look at when they put on a restriction. So when they realized that they were peaking, they quickly said no flying, um, no traveling, no, um, um, they banned flights straight out and they started all of their mask wearing restrictions and all of that. And they, they accompanied that with a very strong vaccination protocol. And that's when their numbers started to fall. So it's something that shows that it has to go hand in hand, right? So um, again, what are the risks for children? who are generally asymptomatic, right? Because we're saying that they're not showing, uh, they don't usually show symptoms in any normal way. This individual, this 16 year old Brampton girl showed no symptoms up until the very last day um, before they took her to the hospital and she died within 24 hours because her symptoms were so atypical because um, she had more of the multi-inflammatory syndrome than the full COVID symptoms that we found. And they were so um, uh, lax to test her. The same thing with the Brazilian child that I showed. Um, they refused to test that 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 three-year-old because they were like, well, it can't be COVID because three-year-olds don't get COVID. And by the time he uh, showed real symptoms, it was too late for him. Um, same thing happened with her. So really, at the end of the day, while you are vaccinated, you need to be considerate of the fact that there are members of your family that are not vaccinated. And there is a serious risk and a real risk for them. Right. So vaccinations have to take place in all um, age groups. 12 to 16 year olds were just approved this week for Pfizer. Um, two to 12 year olds will be approved in September, 2020. And asymptomatic people must still get vaccinated to get neutralizing antibodies, right? Should you wait for a vaccine of choice? Everybody wants their better vaccine? No, take any vaccine that's available. The virus will keep mutating. It's not a concern how effective a vaccine is against a particular variant because this is going to continue to mutate, right? You need protection now from whatever is there now. And you will probably have to get boosters, yes, um, I was asked this on, on uh, one of the talk shows that I did and, and the host was very, you know, oh my God, am I going to have to get a booster? Yeah, yeah probably, right? We do that for flu. Um, we can do it. We do it for other things, hepatitis. We do that for tetanus. Every 10 years, you have to get a tetanus. It might be a little sooner than that. Um, the vaccines will probably have to be tweaked eventually if the mutants get so far away from what we have right now um, that they to be able to respond. But, and we might get to a point where we have to get yearly um, vaccinations, but we have to get there somehow, right? Just to kind of show you the politics behind it, this is the supply agreement, and it kind of shows you the disparity between countries, right? Um, in terms of what is happening. Oh gosh, I don't know what just happened there. Um, right. Um, in terms of what is happening with the with the types of vaccines and what is available, right? So if you look at Canada, they like super bought, right? They were like well packed in in terms of the vaccinations per capita, and yet they are very far behind um, because their supply hasn't been there. United States, um, United Kingdom, Australia, and so on, and go all the way down to India, which sadly is producing vaccines, but producing vaccines for other country, um, other countries around the world because of their contracts, right? So they don't have vaccines for their own country. Most of that is being produced, if you notice the color, um, that kind of um, uh, pinkish color is their local vaccine, the Covaxin from the Gamalaya Institute, right? Um, so that's one thing that we have to consider is that a lot of the terms of, of of vaccines are political, right? Um, in terms of infection and exposure as well, it's important to remember vaccinated people might harbor the virus, but they may not necessarily transmit it. Um, and they will get an immune um, boost as well from exposure, right? Um, depending on the vaccine, it prevents severe disease and death up to 100% amongst um, vaccinated people. And if you're fully vaccinated, it's extremely unlikely that you would get severe disease, even if you get some sort of infection. Um, in terms of the vaccine politics, again, what's a feature for AstraZeneca and JJ and J in terms of the vaccines linked to rare clotting disorders? Um, it was published that if you look at the, the countries that are high risk versus uh, high infection rates versus low infection rates, it's much more um, uh, easy to see that in individuals that have low infection rates where you have a choice, you can take it or leave it. But individuals that have high infection rates where there's no choice, there's a great advantage to be given um, with AstraZeneca in terms in the, in the coming months for, for uh, vaccine equity. 
um, because it ensures that the poor countries can vaccinate their populations as well. A lot of individual countries cannot afford the mRNA vaccines and they cannot store them or distribute them. So it is, it's not an option. So the AstraZeneca and the JGNJs and the ones that have that similar technology have to be accessible and um, acceptable. So individuals have to, to um, buy in, right? In terms of what's happening. As the pandemic retreats and we get more and more vaccines, of course you can pick and choose, no problem. If there are other inexpensive, easy to distribute shots and technologies, yes, no problem. Like in Cuba, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Brazil, they're developing their own versions. And that's great, but technically you should take the AstraZeneca vaccine if you're offered it and any other types of vaccine if you're offered it um, once your risks have been accessed. Who should not take it? We'd like to stress this again, allergies to any components, um, previous anaphylactic reactions to drugs and vaccines, people under 30, low COVID-19 risk individuals, um, people who are pregnant and breastfeeding in particular, these studies have not been finished, under 16 year olds and individuals who are at risk for clotting disorders. And we can test you for these using all the different um, techniques that we've talked about. Um, if I had COVID, should I get a vaccine? Yes, because immunity can weaken over time and it can be strengthened with vaccinations. Even if a person has contracted and recovered, their immunity can be boosted by a vaccine. So it's very important for you to get the vaccine um, if you get COVID. Should I still wear a mask? Yes. Um, it's gonna save lives because the virus starts COVID. I showed you all that infection um, little uh, diagram. It's typically entering through the nose and we, the vaccine will prevent sickness from the virus, but it is possible to carry enough virus to infect someone else, right? Through coughing and sneezing. So that's important. Um, Pfizer made a bunch of money. This just shows that they made 3.5 billion in revenue. To kind of give you a kind of idea, you know, people are like Pfizer, 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 Moderna, Moderna, Moderna. You have to remember that Pfizer, Moderna are for profit. And you, uh, you, this is one of the things that uh, people don't seem to realize. The poor the country and the more developing the country, the less able they are to be able to afford these guys. So it's not necessarily that they're better because they all form clots, they all have a clotting risk, they all have um, TTIT risks, they all have all the other risks of all the other vaccines, right? The idea is what can you afford and what can you afford to give your, your populace, right? I keep on stressing all the different types of tests that are available, right? The antibody test, the RT-PCR test, the antigen test. We do it at Genex Diagnostics along with other different labs. And um, I think antigen and antibody, pretty much any doctor can do. They're actually antigen tests at home, um, home kits as well too as antibody tests um, that are available um, in other countries that will eventually be available here for you to be able to test. And I recommend everybody test, test, test. You need to know your status. Trinidad still, still set, sits at about 3.5%. Um, we're still waiting on vaccines from the COVAX order to be filled, but we cannot depend on one type of vaccine. We have to get the population access to global herd immunity, and the only way to do that is through anything that is available vaccine-wise, right? Until vaccination is widespread, we can't get there, and we have to continue to practice physical distancing, hand hygiene, all of that. And um, are the vaccines enough to prevent infections? Not necessarily. Um, we will, we, it really has to be a combination of the, the, the social distancing, the mask wearing, the lack of movement, the restrictions, and the vaccines to be able to get there. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more on Friday um, in terms of what herd immunity is and how do we end the pandemic and how do we work together to really to get to that point. So I want to stress this again. We have to, it has to be a combination. We have to limit the host reduce trafficking of these um, exotic animals to be able to stop us from being infected by mutants that actually jump the species barrier and become zoonotic. We have to wear masks to stop the exits portals. We have to sanitize and maintain distance to stop the modes of transmission. We have to vaccinate to be able to stop us from being a susceptible host and achieve herd immunity to be able to get this infectious microbe under control where we are just treating it as one of the many other diseases that we have. Um, that we need to take vaccines for or treat, right? We're going to get there somehow. So get vaccinated. That was my end um, story that I always try to leave with you all. Um, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Ramlachan. Now, welcome to our question and answer segment. The viewing public is now asked to send your questions via the YouTube chat. Okay, so we have the first question. Can a person who has gotten, this is Margaret, Ms. Margaret Ramden, a person who has gotten the vaccine, both doses, 
contract the COVID-19 or can they only get one of the variants? Okay, well, I kind of went through this a little bit. There's something called breakthrough cases, which is, happens in about 5,000 so far out of 78 million. So it's very, very rare for, for individuals to um, break through and get COVID. Um, individuals, of course, who've been exposed to new variants where they are, have become variants of concern that have turned into variants of high significance. If you'd remember any earlier talks, we talked about those variants that have mutated enough to break away and evade immunity. That's where that comes into play. So yeah, there's always a chance that a mutant uh, variant will be able to evade immunity, i.e. Um, make the vaccine that you've gotten ineffective because your antibodies no longer are going to be able to act as a neutralizing agent against it. So that may eventually happen. The only way that we can stop that is stop humans from being a host and stop having this large pool of unvaccinated humans around allowing that um, that situation to, to keep going on and on and on. Okay, so we have another question uh, from Lisa. Why do some vaccines require boosters? How well would you say our public health system in Trinidad and Tobago has done with respect to getting its citizens vaccinated over the years? Okay, so that's two questions, two different questions, right? So what's the first one? The first one is why do some vaccines require boosters? Okay, so generally it will require a booster because I, the way that I explain it, the analogy is your first shot is like if you've gone to ed elementary school and you've educated your immune system to the level of elementary school. Your second shot is university. So you're maturing the, the immune response. So now it's, <clears throat> it's able to be boosted and be able to respond a lot better. That's the analogy and why we need boosters because it's almost like if you're studying for a test, you kind of remember it, but you're not sure. So you need to actually sit down with the books again and re re redo the, all the work and try to get to that higher level of understanding. That's really what the second booster does. It gives you that higher level of immu immunity. Um, in terms of how we responded, we need vaccines and we need more testing. Um, testing has to be done. Um, people have to submit to testing. A lot of times in Trinidad, we're blaming the government and we're blaming the health service system, but I know plenty of people who've been exposed and they're home. Uh, they're like, hmm, I, I just gonna stay home and uh, I don't want to get tested. And you have to get tested. You have to be part of the community. You have to be part of the testing um, to be able to contribute to us to know what's there. What if there's a variant, a homegrown variant in Trinidad that we don't even know because you have not been tested and you, we have not been able to sequence that particular variant that you have. So um, testing really has to happen um, and it has to be encouraged. Same thing with vaccination. We have to get more vaccines and we have to get it out there. That's the only way. Restrictions have to be employed because um, that is also a part of the process. Um, once we have an uptick and an upswing, you're going to get more restrictions because the, uh, the, the, the powers that be have to control the movement of individuals and the transmission from person to person because that is where the how and how this virus is spread person to person transmission. So if you want those numbers down, you have to get vaccinated. You all have to be out there in your numbers, getting vaccinated. That's the only way. Look at Israel. That's the only way it's going to happen. So we have another question now. Uh, why was it necessary to develop vaccines in the first place? Can't proper hygiene and diet help decrease the incidence of disease and death? Sure. But then we'll be back any time of the Black Plague and Spanish flu. So back in the day when it is, we had these huge pandemics that killed half the population and, and in case of black, black Plague, 300 million people, which at that point in time was probably more like three quarters of the population of Europe um, died. Um, yeah, sanitation and hygiene changed the story, but we're way beyond that now, right? Um, because of our global movement and our ability to transmit disease, it goes far and beyond um, the, the uh, ability to check that via hygiene and, and diet. There's no way. Um, these infectious diseases are deadly, they're fatal, the mortality rates are high. In the case of um, COVID-19, people argue that it's 2%, 3%. Yeah, but it's 10% or 15% in people with comorbidities, and it's 10 and 15% in older individuals. And now we're seeing it more and more in everybody, especially if it is mutated in the case of India. Everybody's dying, all the different age groups. So you can't sit back and say, well, I just gonna just not get a vaccine. We have to develop vaccines. We have to take vaccines. There's no way to control infectious disease without vaccination. Look what's happened with malaria. Um, we, we, we've been way behind with malaria. Um, Ebola, we were, we were able to catch it quick with a vaccine and stop it in its tracks. Um, and mortality rate with Ebola was 99%, very, very close to 100%. 
Um, those are the things that we have to deal with and, and no amount of diet and exercise and, and um, immune building drugs and saline, saline rinses and you know face washing and I don't know what else is going to help that people suggest is going to help that vaccination is the only way. Thank you. So we have another question. Uh, if it weren't for vaccines, where would we be today? You would have answered that already. Why, why yeah. do some vaccines require boosters? I did answer that one already too. How well would you say our public health system in TNT? I did answer that done? one already too. Yeah. Right, so we have no questions at the moment. Okay. All right, so. All right, so you want to close up? Thank you. So I wish to take this opportunity to conclude part four of this series. And in doing so, I encourage you to join us again on Friday, the 7th of May at 6 p.m., where herd immunity will be discussed. Thank you, stay safe, and do enjoy the rest of our evening. And don't forget our closing number five, which is going to be very, you know, exciting, right? So see you.